On this Sunday night, one million cases in Canada and counting. The crisis we're still facing and the human cost. It's not cases, it's people. Plus, a lottery for leftover vaccine doses. Is it ethical? Players testing positive. The Canadian NHL team sidelined by COVID-19. Major League Baseball takes a stand on election reform in the state of Georgia and the moving memorial to lives lost in this pandemic. And it's like a nightmare I'm hoping to wake up from still. Global National with Robin Gill. Good evening and thank you for joining us. The fight against the COVID-19 pandemic in this country is not going the way we hoped. Case numbers are spiking yet again. Yesterday, Canada crossed the 1 million mark for confirmed COVID-19 cases. A year ago, that was the number of people infected worldwide. Back in April 2020, the idea of receiving a vaccine seemed a long way off. As of today, more than 5.5 million Canadians have received at least one dose. That's 14.7% of the population. But it's the variants fueling this latest surge of infections that have medical professionals worried. And as Abigail Beeman reports, it's an extra challenge with such a low percentage of the population protected. Uh, here's your chocolate and your egg. Chocolate on a chair, no direct handoff for an Easter Sunday that looks so different a second year in a row. Families can safely drive around town, um, mask up, come pick up their Easter egg. Canada hit a grim holiday weekend milestone, one million COVID-19 cases. It's people for me. Uh, a million people is a lot of people, uh, but more importantly, it's a rapidly increasing number in the wrong groups of people who don't have access to enough services in Canada. Cases are climbing in several provinces spurned by variants. Potentially the busiest they've been in 15 years. After a drop in COVID-19 hospital admissions in BC, Dr. Gerald DeRosa is now seeing them climb. One of the bigger concerns I think is with some of these variants that we are seeing uh, younger people getting quite a bit sicker um, and requiring a lot of critical care support. More younger people in hospital in part because older Canadians are more likely to be vaccinated and protected and because there are simply more people getting sick with variants that are more easily transmissible. One BC researcher estimates variants account for half of all new cases. Alberta says it's 35% of cases there, and it's investigating one, quote, significant outbreak. The situation that we're living right now in terms of variants is different from the one that we had last year. These variants are much more highly transmittable, and they're more prone for you to get severe symptoms. The ICUs never really decompressed from the second wave, unfortunately, and uh, and ICU capacity certainly remains a major issue. Dr. Isaac Bogosh is working on the COVID ward this long weekend. He says they're getting more admissions, but across Ontario, ICUs are the real problem. If we carry on in this trajectory, ward beds will also be a problem as well. Dr. Bogosh says the million case marker presents an opportunity to think about how we can make things better going forward. Here in Ontario, there's a real push to vaccinate vulnerable essential workers faster and better support people who can't work from home. Abigail Beeman, Global News, Ottawa. Many Canadians are still waiting to get the vaccine, but in some parts of the country, there are lotteries to get doses that would otherwise go unused. That's led to an ethical debate. As Catherine Ward explains, experts believe these efforts not to waste a drop once again underscore the disparities in this pandemic. We're going to drop five names because we're going to have less than five vaccines. Waiting in the cold Saturday, a crowd gathered at a vaccine clinic in North Toronto, hoping their name would be called for a chance at a leftover dose of a COVID-19 vaccine. Okay, first name. Uh, The person who sent this video to Global News did not want to be identified for privacy reasons, but says they were allowed to put their name in this lottery, even though they are not yet eligible. We reached out to the clinic for comment, but did not hear back by deadline. 
Reasons for leftover doses vary, which include unfilled or cancelled appointments. In a statement, Ontario's Ministry of Health says public health units and vaccination clinics have been directed to put in place processes to fill last-minute cancellations and end-of-day doses with people who are identified as priority populations. Susan LaRue knows what it's like to win the vaccine lottery. She stopped by a pharmacy in Vancouver to get on a wait list, but because she qualified by age, LaRue left with that much sought after shot in the arm. He said to me, well, actually we had a no show so you can get it now. So I was like, what? <laughs> now? Some experts say making sure priority groups getting vaccinated first is key, but at the same time, suggesting no doses should be wasted, even if it means some people get the shot before they are eligible. You can't have unfilled spots, fill the spots. And if people are, you know, 18 and up, I have no problem with anyone getting vaccinated if there's unfilled spots. Vaccines aren't going to expire, by the way. The you know Pfizer vaccine can sit for about five days in a refrigerator once it's been thawed. Moderna can sit for a month. Like The vaccines aren't going to go to waste, but the spaces are going to go to waste. And there's no reason for that to happen. Other doctors say relying on lotteries to ensure all doses are used means luck won't necessarily prevail for those most at risk. And we have to recognize that this is not an equal opportunity virus. When we pull a name out of a hat in terms of who gets the COVID-19 vaccine, it can mean that people are left out. I think that there has to be a more effective um, way to make sure that extra doses are going to those who need it. Currently, there is no national strategy on what to do with leftover COVID vaccine doses. Such policies are up to provincial and local authorities. Robin? Catherine Ward in Toronto. Thanks, Catherine. Let's take some time here to show you the trajectory of the pandemic, in large part due to the swift and vicious variants. As of April 1st, there have been more than 11,000 confirmed cases of variants of concern. The majority of these, more than 10,000 cases, involve the B117 variant that emerged in the UK. The P1 variant associated with Brazil is also taking hold in some provinces, with nearly 500 cases nationally. In Saskatchewan, where there have been more than 2,200 infections linked to variants of concern, parts of the province are once again in lockdown. Nathaniel Dove reports. It's probably sick of me phoning. I phone eight, I phone eight times a day. This Easter, all Sheena Nult is able to do is call her relatives. It's scary that they could get sick, but it's also terrifying that they have to deal with everything alone. The COVID-19 pandemic is keeping her close family apart. It's been hard on her mom. Normal doesn't come and lock you back down and get scared again of the new variant that's coming. So we were scared before and we're even more scared now. And her best friend, who's more of a sister. She doesn't even know my new stepson. She doesn't know my new boyfriend. She doesn't know their personalities at all or what our dynamic is like. Our They're all in different cities in Saskatchewan and experiencing different stages of the third wave. Jesse Boss lives in Regina, which is locked down. The city accounts for the vast majority of cases caused by the variants of concern, mostly the more contagious B117. Tammy Nault is in Moose Jaw, which is close behind the Queen City, but isn't under lockdown yet. Saskatoon has just a fraction of the cases Regina does, but a public health professor at the University of Saskatchewan is warning that won't last. The big issue with the two cities is time right now. Uh, it's, uh, it's like uh, looking into the future. Epidemiologist Corey Newdorf says Saskatoon needs to prepare for the worst. Hospitalizations in the province are trending up and a record number of people are in intensive care units. Newdorf says the variants are the cause and knowing when to clamp down again is the strongest defense. Give an inch and, and we're going to take a mile on this. I think it's going to be here. It's just a matter of time when. So I'm not scared. I'm anxious. Sheena Nault says knowing what's coming doesn't make it any easier. She's worried about her family and every phone call is bittersweet. Love you. Too. Nathaniel Dove, Global News, Saskatoon. The Vancouver Canucks are an example of how quickly the variant first identified in Brazil can attack. 20 players and coaches have tested positive for COVID-19, and several of those cases are the more contagious P1 variant. The virus has spread through the team despite strict safety protocols put in place by the league, like daily testing. The NHL is proceeding on the assumption that the entire team will likely test positive. 
Some of the Canucks are reportedly very ill, with symptoms that include vomiting, cramping and dehydration. And some of their family members have already tested positive. In the U.S., Major League Baseball is taking a stand on voter rights. The league decided to pull its all-star game out of Atlanta because of the state's controversial election bill. Opponents argue the new law will hurt minorities the most. But as Jennifer Johnson reports, Georgia's governor has come out swinging. Atlanta has struck out after Major League Baseball pulled its July All-Star game out of the city. The MLB made the decision in protest of Georgia's new restrictive voting law, requiring new IDs for mail-in ballots, limiting ballot drop-off boxes, and making it illegal for anyone except poll workers to offer food or water to voters waiting in lines. Major League Baseball caved to fear and lies from liberal activists. They ignored the facts of our new election integrity law and they ignored the consequences of their decision on our local community. Georgia's governor says he's not backing down even as Americans take to social media, calling on consumers to boycott Delta Airlines and Coca-Cola, two big-name Georgia-based corporations. Nearly 200 companies across the country have condemned the new law. The MLB's decision will cost the state an estimated $100 million in tourism dollars. While I certainly am disappointed that Major League Baseball has decided to pull the All-Star game from Cobb County, Georgia, I certainly do understand. Shame on Governor Kemp! Georgia voters are protesting the restrictions, saying they specifically target black voters who turned out in record numbers in the 2020 election. Dozens of other state legislatures are considering similar bills, which Democrats say are all aimed at suppressing minority voters. It's just another way to keep us from turning our vote in. The Republican-backed bill passed after former President Donald Trump repeated baseless claims of widespread voter fraud in Georgia, which Kemp and other election officials disputed. He said there were no issues, and others in uh, charge said there were no issues. So why then are you changing the rules? Already a number of lawsuits have been filed to try and overturn the new law, and President Joe Biden has asked the U.S. Justice Department to investigate just how legal it is. Jennifer Johnson, Global News, Washington. Three Canadians are up for an NCAA basketball title at this year's March Madness Championships. The trophy is a guarantee in the women's final, with Toronto's Alyssa Jerome playing for Stanford, taking on Shayna Pellington of Pickering, Ontario, who plays for Arizona. And tomorrow, Canada's hopes are on Aurora, Ontario's Andrew Nembhard to steal the show in the men's final between Gonzaga and Baylor. Now, if the stars are all aligned, it will be the first time in the tournament's history that a Canadian has won both the men's and women's titles in the same year. A part of Florida is under a state of emergency tonight because a wastewater reservoir is on the verge of collapse and could trigger a major ecological disaster. Hundreds of residents in the Tampa Bay area have been forced to flee their homes immediately. There are fears a pond holding back hundreds of millions of liters of radioactive wastewater could breach at any moment. And if it does, a toxic torrent could come rushing into the neighborhoods below. Florida's governor plans to go after those responsible for the situation. Our administration is dedicated to full enforcement of any damages to our state's resources and holding the company HRK accountable for this event. This is not acceptable. It's not something we will allow to persist. Just over a week ago, a leak was discovered in one of the walls of the 77-acre reservoir, which contains leftover from the production of fertilizer. Coming up, the case for COVID-compliant courtrooms and the Royal Rumble within Jordan's longest ruling family. The pandemic has slowed the wheels of criminal justice in Canada. Prosecutors say it's been difficult getting cases to trial, especially jury trials. They require more space than many courtrooms allow. But as Ross Lord explains, the court system is taking measures to adapt. For those working in the court system, two new courtrooms in Nova Scotia are a welcome sight. The first ever in Atlanta, Canada, to be designed for physical distancing. They're larger than older courtrooms, which means they can hold jury trials while respecting COVID-19 rules. It's been a year uh, since we had some in, in Halifax, our biggest jurisdiction. And you'll see across the country, um, a lot of jurisdictions are struggling to have jury trials. 
They're also struggling to administer justice. The pandemic has forced a shift to virtual or telephone court sessions. Some lawyers who do appear in person are nervous. In a letter to provincial justice officials obtained by Global News, the Union for Federal Prosecutors says it's received troubling reports of inconsistent approaches to health and safety by some courts, tribunals and judicial officers. But COVID-compliant courtrooms could also prevent another big problem. Cases being thrown out of court over long delays in bringing an accused to trial. Something that's happened many hundreds of times across Canada since the Supreme Court's Jordan decision in 2016, including accused killers. Some cases are in Jordan, uh, you know, Jordan danger, meaning that they're over the 30 months for Supreme Court and over 18 months for provincial court. So there are there are some dangers there. The Jordan decision does allow lengthy delays in exceptional circumstances out of the Crown's control. The federal government has promised to clarify with legislation, if necessary, to confirm the pandemic is legally exceptional. In the meantime, governments and the judiciary are exploring more ways to keep the wheels of justice moving. Ross Lord, Global News. Still ahead, the royal rivalry in a Middle East country key to Western allies. You're watching Global National. At least 11 people are dead after a truck collided with a passenger bus in China. The crash happened on a major highway in the eastern part of the country. Initial reports suggest the truck veered into the path of the oncoming bus. Two other trucks rolled over when they swerved to avoid that wreck. More than a dozen people were injured. In Taiwan, crews removed the crumpled carriages of an express train from the tunnel where it derailed on Friday. The death toll from the disaster has been revised to 48 from 51. Nearly 200 people were injured in the crash. It was caused by a truck rolling onto the tracks. Investigators say the truck's emergency brake was not engaged. The driver has since apologized and says he will cooperate with the investigation. The former Crown Prince of Jordan has been placed under house arrest. Prince Hamza bin Hussein, the half-brother of King Abdullah, is one of almost 20 people arrested in the kingdom. The prince is accused of taking part in a plot to destabilize the country with foreign support. Public clashes within the kingdom's long ruling family are rare. Accusations of, of Prince Hamza, for sure this is something new never happened before. Usually problems within the royal family uh, are kept there inside within the royal family. I think um, if there's a mistake that it should be uh, uh, solved within the family and it's important for the royal family to be always united. The prince denies any wrongdoing. He claims he's being punished for speaking out against corruption. The unprecedented move has raised concern about stability in the country that is seen as a key Western ally in the Middle East. In his annual Easter message to the world, the Pope denounced the armed conflicts that are still taking place during a pandemic as scandalous. Francis says there is still too much violence in the world while many people suffer the pandemic's social and economic pressures. He urged countries to expedite global vaccination efforts and not to forget the poorer nations who need help on the inoculation front. On this Easter weekend, Buckingham Palace released photos of the Queen and Prince Charles getting some fresh air while going for a stroll at Frogmore House. The Queen usually takes a walk to St. George's Chapel for Easter services, but this year was a private service with those closest to her. Up next, remembering the victims of the virus at London's Wall of Hearts. The United Kingdom may be one of the leading countries in vaccination efforts, but that doesn't change the fact it's also had one of the worst death tolls in this pandemic. Now, some families in Britain have created a moving memorial to honor the loved ones they've lost to the virus. And as Redmond Shannon reports, the location is a political statement. A simple pink heart repeated over and over and over almost 150,000 times, stretching hundreds of meters along this wall. 
one heart for every person in the UK whose death certificate mentioned COVID-19. Among the volunteers painting hearts is Sophie Rawlings. I came here today because sadly lost both parents in January, seven days apart. Unreal and shocking, it's like a nightmare I'm hoping to wake up from still. So when I see this was going on, I thought they deserve to be part of the wall. They deserve to be remembered like all these other people. The campaign group behind the National Covid Memorial Wall didn't ask for permission from the Borough Council, but they have received its blessing. They're not numbers. They're all names and they're all people and they've all got someone like me devastated on the other end. The location of the memorial is significant. It sits directly opposite the Houses of Parliament and the wall itself backs onto the hospital where Prime Minister Boris Johnson was treated in intensive care for COVID-19. The group doesn't just want to prick the conscience of the government. We're kind of been asking for an inquiry so we can understand what happened, um, how we've ended up where we are and how we've lost all these lives and just kind of understand why we have so many hearts to draw. But just drawing these hearts has made one difference. It's the least I've cried in three months. I was just saying to my friend, I cry every day, all day. But coming here painting these hearts, I don't know why, it's just made me feel, I don't know, nice. <laughs> the group says it will remove the hearts when asked. The British government plans a permanent memorial after the pandemic. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. What a nice story, Redmond. And that is Global National for this Sunday night. I'm Robin Gill. Tonight, your Canada is mile zero of the Great Trail in Victoria, B.C. We'd love to see your corner of the country, so please keep sending your photos to viewers at globalnational.com. Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you back here tomorrow. Have a great night.